Good evening, everybody, Croeso and Noswepa, um, to the Education Scrutiny Meeting of the 2nd of November 2021. Um, if I could just read this statement first. This meeting will be recorded and made available to view via the Council's website, except for discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, the images, audio of those individuals speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the Council's website at www.cafili.gov.uk. Could I ask, um, are there any apologies for absence other than those already passed to the committee? Uh, Chair, uh, Councillor Wynne David said he might be a little bit late, but he is planning to attend the meeting, but he is running a little bit late. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And could I ask then, Mark, if you could take a roll call for, for me tonight? Certainly, Chair. Councillor Oldworth? Present. Councillor Andrews? Present. Councillor Bevan? I'm there. <laughs> Councillor Collis? Present. Councillor Farina Childs? Present. Councillor Gale. Present. Uh, Councillor Havard. Matt. Good boy, Gag. Councillor James. Here. Councillor James. Present. Is it Sammy? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jones. Councillor Miles. Councillor Miles. Councillor Parry. And that. Councillor Robert. Mr. Weston. Present. Mrs. Millington. Mr. James. Mrs. Ireland. Mrs. Havard. And Mr. Davis. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, if I could just read this to you. Councillors and officers are reminded of their personal responsibilities to declare any personal and or prejudicial interests in respect of any item of business on this agenda in accordance with the Local Government Act 2000, the Council's Constitution and the Code of Conduct for both councillors and officers. Thank you. Um, are there any declarations? Okay, doke, we'll go on then. Uh, to approve and sign the, the following min minutes, um, can I just check for accuracy only, please? Um, pages one, two, three, four, and five. Thank you. Um, could I have somebody to move these? I move. Go Thank better. you. And somebody second? Second. I'll second. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, um, we will be voting um, electronically this evening. You'll find the forms in front of you or they should pop up shortly. And if you can make your vote, please. Are there any members joining us by telephone, Mark? Uh, no, Chair. Thank you. I gather that's, that's been carried then 100%, is it? Yes, that's been carried unanimously, Chair. Ten votes for and one abstention. Oh, thank you very much. Um, can I ask then, is there any, um, any matter referred to the committee in accordance with the call-in procedure? 
No, no, no matters have been called in for this meeting, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll go on to the forward work programme. If I could uh, move on to you then, Mark, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, members are asked to consider the forward work programme for this committee alongside the cabinet work programme um, as appended to the report in your packs and to suggest any changes. Um, if members are happy, I would like to seek approval to publish the Education Scrutiny Committee forward work programme um, onto the Council's website. So thank you, Chair. Thank you. Can I ha ask, um, I believe Derek has a, a question on the forward work programme. On the, um, thank you, Chair, on the, um, the vocation, uh, I can't find it at the moment. On the, on the, on, in December, we, we are scheduled to discuss vocational studies item. The vocational offer uh, report, um, Councillor Havard. Thank you, vocational officer. Could someone tell me what, what it is we will be discussing, please? OK, I'm not sure if um, Kerry Cole might be available just to add a, put a bit of meat on the bones for you, Councillor. <laughs> well, Richard um, Edmonds, um, Ed will, will pop in on this, I think. Oh, thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Members. And thanks, Councillor Havard. Yeah, if you recall, this was the workshop that we agreed to, I think it was late spring. Yes. Uh, where I think a number of members have made representations about the vocational offer. So what we'll be doing with you that particular evening is we'll be presenting the Caffili Pathways website. We'll be looking for a number of external speakers, potentially from our, our head teacher uh, fraternity and across the colleges to come and bring to life for you, the committee, the things that are on offer in vocational terms across Caffili and give you the opportunity to engage with those, uh, th those members of staff, those contributors, and make sure that you're comfortable with the offer that is available uh, and if not to make some suggestions to us uh thank you uh, um director i if you remember back in the at the time when i re first raised the matter i i was anxious to get a survey of what is already being done in our schools um in terms of um the, the vocational uh, certificates that are on offer um that's what I wanted really was to find out how much uh, have we have we done any uh, a survey of the in in that direction? Um, not not a survey as far as I'm aware, Councillor Haver, but you will have the opportunity to engage directly with the head teachers on that matter. Thank you, thank you, Director. Thank you, Councillor Phil Bevan. Are you taking additions to the forward work uh, program? Yes, I'm asking, I'm asking for an addition. At yep. some time during the uh, in the WESP, it refers to the lack of Welsh medium teachers, but it also refers that the that we will or somebody will be working with EAS National Academy for Education uh, to to see if there's any way that courses can be introduced for um, Welsh medium teachers. So I was just wondering whether if there is a report, whether that could be included somewhere next year to see if there is any progress on finding uh, Welsh medium teachers for primary and comprehensive, of course. OK, I'm sure perhaps we can get some um, input uh, on that. Um, so that's a sorry, Chair. So that's a report on the provision of Welsh medium teachers. Was it Councillor Bevan? Yes, please. OK, thank uh, you. I get the hand down for some reason. You've managed oh, it, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Martin James. Oh, thank you, Chair. What, what I would like possibly in the new year, forward work flow, if I could, could we have a report on how our children are coping after the pandemic with their well-being and mental health issues and how we as an authority are dealing with it? And, you know, is it getting worse or are we managing it? Just, just have some idea for these young people, because it seemed to, you know, you've seen to hear a lot of, lot of children struggling. So I'd like to know what we're doing as an authority, and the schools. I know what the school I'm involved with doing, but what schools are doing? Sorry to to help these uh, young students. Okay, Doc. So, um, 
perhaps perhaps we could have um, uh, it's a suggestion really some a head teacher or oh, uh, um, Ed is like to come in thank you yeah look I think the the representations we've had from members so far about the forward work program all, all entirely valid it's probably worth just pointing out to members that the number of meetings that we've got available now prior to the run into the elections next year relatively limited so we may be competing for space I know Councillor Bevan mentioned uh, next year, so that might give us a few more opportunities, but we'll work with you, Chair, and you as committee members to try and get those things scheduled uh, as, as time will permit. Yeah. Thank you. If, if the time is lacking at all, perhaps we could have it as an information item as well. But um, when it comes to the well-being of the children, I think... Um, it, you know, it, this is very important. You know, it's a f you know few months on now, and and let's see how how the um, the situation is either improving or or is stagnant. So we we need to know really. Thank you, Councillor Phil Bevan. You have your hand up again. Thank you, Chair. Oh, it won't go down. Wait, hold on a minute. Get down, you. Why you want to go down then? That is down. Oh yeah. Oh, that and it's back up. <laughs> I got fat fingers like John, is it? Right, okay. So um if we want to um if I can have somebody to move the um uh, forward work program, please. Yeah, move. Thank you. And somebody <clears throat> recommend uh sorry. Do the recommendation. Awesome. Thank you. Right, OK, we will be asked to vote on this. So if you can pop your votes in the electronic voting system, please. Let's see if we... Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, that's been carried unanimously, Chair. 12 votes for and no votes against and no abstentions. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, can I ask as well, ha has the Cabinet, any Cabinet report been brought forward for review at this meeting? Uh, no, no, no uh, report has been brought forward for review at this, uh, at this meeting, Chair. OK, well, th there is a slight change to our itinerary for this evening. We won't go to item seven as yet. We will go to item eight, which is um, uh, it's actually the youth service delivery and support during COVID uh, presentation. I'm going to hand over to Paul O'Neill, uh, the senior youth service manager to introduce. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, good evening to everyone, and thank you very much for having the Youth Service along this evening. Um, we'd, we'd like to spend a little time telling you about how, what we've been up to during COVID. I know that um, this room, more than most, is, is, is very well informed about these things, but there may be a few items that, that we, can, um, we can enlarge on for you. Um, what we'd like to do this evening is, is show you a presentation, but embedded in the presentation is also a brief film made by our young people and our youth workers. Uh, and at the end, we'd like to bring in some real young people to tell you uh, what their experience has been like being supported by the youth, youth service during the height of, of lockdown. Uh, what I will do is I'll be sharing my screen um, to show you the presentation. So please bear with me while I'm doing that. If any hands go up, I won't be able to see them. Uh, and I may not be able to, to hear you. Quite a noisy film. And it's a bit of a heads up. Um, so, but I'm happy to take uh, any questions uh, late, later on, please. Um, so bear with me and now I'm going to share my screen. So, um, if you're a service, um, uh, like all services for young people in CCBC, um, we've been very busy during COVID supporting young people, especially vulnerable young people, whilst trying to keep, the, if you like, the day job going. Um, with our brand of education for all young people in the county borough. Um, let's start off with a film just to give you a flavour of the experience of some of the young people from a selection of our projects in the youth service. And here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
But at that point, I do beg you, do beg your pardon. I'm going to reshare the screen. Uh, I don't think everyone was getting the, the sound there. So bear with me. Hello. <laughs> Big thank you to um, Rachel for making sure I'm safe and um, I'm staying in for the pandemic. When I heard that we were going on lockdown, I got scared. We received a bag full of, of arts and crafts. All of this was absolutely fantastic and kept my mind active. Also, every Wednesday via Zoom, we would do cooking. I love doing this, so thank you to the youth service for doing regular phone calls to see if we were all okay and safe. But most of all, for being there. If it wasn't for you, me and my family wouldn't have got through it. The youth service supported me over lockdown by regular phone calls that helped me to do my Princess Trust qualification to help me get a place in college. Lockdown made me sad because we couldn't go out anyway and it made me happy because we done stuff with the CAG, the group, and we done cooking, cat step challenge, camping, um, cat hula hoop challenge and um, loads of activities and it made me happy. Rachel and Jess, um, oh, they've helped me through COVID and they always there for me. We've been on walks and we did cooking online. I've seen Rachel like every week and if not, then I've spoken to her like every week. The youth have supported me by giving me plenty of art resources to, give, to keep me busy and safe. They make me feel supported and didn't forget about me. So during the lockdown, I was always inside bored doing nothing. They gave me some resources such as activities like healthy relationship, self-esteem. Also, we did some debating with the U Forum and that made me confident in myself and confident speaking to other people also working as a team. We did cooking sessions and that was good and fun as I learnt new things to cook with the youth service. You have really helped me and changed my life. And if it wasn't for you, I would um, be the girl or woman I was today. So thank you. In lockdown, I loved cooking because it helped me calm down. And as well, when we were in lockdown, when I had problems with a couple of my friends, I could phone Carly and Amy. When we did camping, it made me happier. During lockdown, Chris texted me once a week, twice, twice a week if necessary. Uh, he called me like once every fortnight. Uh, he also offered me like a, a couple of group sessions to attend over the six weeks and also lockdown. Yeah. That's the end of the film. You can probably tell our kids and staff really enjoyed um, making that. Uh, and it, they would have wanted to make it half an hour, but I, I said it had to be five minutes long. So next time it'll be half an hour. Uh, so a quick, a quick bit of background. Uh, most people will know uh, how the service is made up here in Kifili. Uh, we are our largest statutory education provider here with pre-lockdown around 16,000 learners. Um, our profile of delivery is across a 13 hour day every day of the year apart from Christmas Day, and actually we're, we're reviewing that one. Um, the, the settings in which we deliver our brand of education are, are various. Sometimes it's in a building, sometimes it's in a street, uh, on a street corner or uh, in a park, uh, and increasingly online, which has been the COVID experience. Um, and people in this, in this room will have come across different parts of the youth service 
in their travel, such as uh, our open access work in the evenings, youth clubs, we've got a very large families first division, uh, the youth forum, whose young people often come before you um, to tell you about their annual priorities. Um, we also run the county's young persons LGBTQ plus group, um, which is which is growing exponentially. Uh, we're also responsible for the um, uh, the, uh, the the lowering of needs figures across the authority, which we either stop people becoming needs or if they are needs, we unneed them. Um, we are also responsible for um, ending youth homelessness uh, across the authority. Um, we have a crime reduction section. Um, community inclusion is a big part of what we do. We run several of the, the groups in the uh, directorate's EOTAS portfolio, that's education other than at school, and we do other things besides. So that's that's what we are, where we are, and, and what we do. So our COVID response, um, because of the flexibility of, of our particular education service, we were able to adapt immediately. Um, this meant uh, closing premises uh, literally overnight um, um, and trying to have contact, contact with young people via other means. And as you will imagine, there were certain young people that we were more concerned about than others. Um, and we very quickly uh, focused on the vulnerable young people that we were already seeing and focusing on supporting vulnerable young people that we did not yet know. Um, so that's this is a, a, a stream of work that runs throughout the year, regardless of COVID. Um, and although the youth service is very much an open access form of education, um, the support for the vulnerable is something that we do all the time. We very quickly implemented new working practices, um, so a lot more street work than before, a lot more online work, which was the experience by many other providers too. Um, and very quickly, the focus was very much for emotional support for, for the most vulnerable. The impact of our work, um, it's very interesting. We've had some surprising responses. Uh, we found that the families of our young people often lent on us for support during this period as well. Um, so the youth, the youth work approach seems to work well with adults too. Um, we were able to provide that continuity of educational contact, um, especially during the first six months of lockdown when, when schools were perhaps less able to reach out to their young people. Um, and I think the youth service provided a crucial stopgap during that, that period. We, um, we found that uh, because of the approaches by families during COVID, we are now engaging more with them deliberately. Um, so I think that's very much challenged our traditional age range of 11 to 25. We now work with a range of age raises, so that's an interesting uh, characteristic from the last 18 months. And at the height of lockdown last year, we had quite intensive work with about a thousand of our most vulnerable young people. Um, to give a comparison, so before lockdown, we worked with about 16,000 young people. And currently we are working with several thousand, not just the vulnerable, but working back up to that pre-COVID figure. And in fact, um, we've just been looking at our, our actions for the coming year, and we are trying to reach 20,000 in the next year, as well as part of the COVID recovery plan. So what are we doing? Well, actually, the, incredibly, we've reduced the needs figures in the last year. Um, we thought that that would be a huge problem, but we found that a lot of young people became captive audiences during COVID because they couldn't go anywhere. Um, so unfortunately, they were cornered by, by the youth service um, and we managed to find them destinations. So we have been reducing these figures over the last year, which has been a pleasant surprise. Um, uh, we all know that young people's mental health has suffered in this time. So we've been pivotal in securing uh, more dedicated therapeutic support and intervention for young people. Uh, and making that, that service more slick than it might have been before. Also, um, because we've been out there on the streets at night and, and so forth during COVID, I think that has reduced the impact on the police. For example, we've been able to advise young people not to congregate in large groups, not to spread the virus. And I think that has made the police's job easier. And certainly they've, they've signaled that to us during the last 18 months. We managed to keep our, our structures going, including the, the democracy structures with the youth forum, um, appearing before yourselves, um, and we've had uh, communications throughout with with the leader, who, by a fortunate coincidence, is also our, our youth champion during this time. And young people were able to tell them to tell the, the authority via that, that those means the, the effect on lockdown um, in terms of their well-being. Um, so we've reduced the spread of coronavirus by educating young people. We've also delivered uh, vaccination education to young people too, so that more of them have come forward for. For the jab, I'm pleased to report. And I think it's fair to say that Kefili Youth Service 
and by implication CCBC have had uh, its reputation enhanced because we've led on a number of COVID related responses during the last 18 months and others have taken on taken on board our approaches. We, uh, of course, like many others, have had to develop online ways of engaging uh, during this time. We thought we had a crap before then. Well, of course, we didn't. We all got caught out by COVID. We quickly redeveloped those structures. Um, and uh, as a result, for example, with our online work, um, our, our strategy has been adopted by Welsh Government and copied across the EU services in Wales. So I think we fully can, can be said to be a leading light in, in that regard. Um, we've had to talk to our funders. We are, we are funded by various means in the EU service. They have very strict targets we have to adhere to. So we've talked with them at length during COVID to change those targets to, if you like, be COVID friendly. Uh, and we are overachieving at present and we are confident of being um, refunded in the, during the next round. The management of the service has been different. Um, normally, for example, myself and my colleagues would be able to have a lot of face-to-face -face contact with staff. That has been different this time around. And in the same way that staff have had a lot of online contact with young people, so our contact with staff has been online too. So it's been different uh, and it has been effective. Our partners um, have been our best friends during this time. Um, and you know it's very important to, to stress that we've achieved what we have because of the cooperation between youth service, schools, uh, the police, social services and other partners. I mean, this um, you know, team Kefili effort truly has worked in, in, our, in our case. At the end of the day, the difference with the youth service and the reason why we've done well during this time is the sheer reach that we have and the flexibility in terms of our vision of education. We have made a difference, we feel. Uh, well, we know that. We've, we've asked young people what their experiences have been. And as you see in the film, people are very vocal in terms of telling us what their experience has been with the youth service in terms of all its, the impact of all its different teams. Um, Young people and their families, the most vulnerable, um, have been telling us that you know, it's, this has been a lifeline for them during this period. Um, for those with emerging mental health and emotional health needs, having a trusted friend available during this time, we think has been absolutely pivotal in terms of ensuring that their mental health needs haven't, haven't gone to a higher level and become more serious. Um, for those who would have been at risk of COVID-19, we, we hope we've got a way of proving it. and We hope that our efforts have helped to to reduce the spread of COVID-19 and the education sessions we've delivered and the advice we've given on the streets has been well received. Uh, of course, we do have quite a lot of EOTAS learners across the youth service as well. Um, we've able, been able to maintain contact with them uh, through all the time. And we see them anyway, not just during school hours, but we see them all the time in the evenings and at weekends. So we have good contact all the time. Uh, our LGBT young people, um, uh, often quite sidelined in society, uh, uh, come forward and helped us to, to, to restructure the support mechanisms we have for them in the authority. And as a result of those conversations, we are enlarging the LGBTQ offer for young people in the future. And of course, that depends on COVID and what that has in store for us. But we have a number of plans to enlarge that aspect of our work. Neat young people, as I said, we've reduced the number of needs in the authority. And also we've been engaging with the homeless um, Pre-COVID, this would have been homeless prevention. During COVID, this has been crisis homelessness work. Where we've been going in and speaking to young people who no one else has contact with, and ensuring that they have a roof over their head. Okay, a quick whistle stop of some of our stats. And the stats on the page here are just from the first nine months of lockdown. Um, so very quickly, uh, in the first nine months, we saw over 2,000 young people and their families supported at least once a week by us. Um, nearly 8,000 face-to-face contacts with, with individuals during that time, either on the doorstep or in, in COVID safe areas where we can provide wellbeing support. Um, 4,500 young people supported on the streets and in other ways. Uh, 1,300 virtual group sessions. So there we are, that's the impact of the online work that we have. This is just the first nine months of COVID last year. Um, 26,000 phone calls made to our young people and their families for support during that time. Um, and 9,000 different types of well-being packs delivered to, to our young people, uh, all sorts of things. Um, recipes and ingredients, you might have heard those youngsters on the film talking about the cooking they did. That was a big hit. Um, so we delivered the recipes and then we cooked online with them. Uh, uh, very successful and we're carrying that work on now as well. 
lots of fun stuff, um, quizzes and, and different types of challenges online just to keep people switched on during COVID. Um, and we have a special uh, messaging system for young people where we send them we send them letters periodically just to tell them that they're doing well and that, that they're, they're well thought of and to hang on in there. So that's just a quick whistle stop tour of the kind of stuff that we'd be doing just for during the first nine months of COVID. And lastly, um, I was thinking about which area to show you in terms of some of the more uh, measurable work that we do with young people. And here we have uh, the way we measure uh, an area which people call soft skills. I don't think they're terribly soft. Uh, so this is increasing in confidence, improvement in communication skills, improvement in teamwork skills, improvement in individual self-esteem and improvement in decision-making skills. And as you can see by the chart there, it goes back to 2013-14. And the results are pretty good across the board. But when you get to the COVID period down the bottom, the results are pretty good too. So I think this, this shows that we are still having an impact albeit by different means with our young people. And uh, this uh, presentation will be made available to members uh, following this Tuesday. Well, look, that's enough from me. Um, I think the, the interesting bit really is, is where young people come here and, and, and tell you directly what their experience has been like being supported by the, by the youth service. Um, so I'm just gonna, gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. And, and without further ado, I'm going to invite the first of our young people on. I just explain how it's going to work this evening. Um, we have uh, young people at home with their families who are going to, to join us in a moment uh, and have a chat. Um, but also present in the room are, are their youth workers who are there for, for moral support as well. Um, so I'm really hoping the technology works this evening. So uh, please wish us luck with this one. So I'm going to invite um, a young fellow called Rami to turn on his uh, turn on his video uh, and his microphone and have a little chat with us and tell us what his experience was like being supported by the youth service during COVID. Rami, how are you doing? Uh, good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take it away. Good evening. My name is Rami. My youth worker is Michelle, and I am part of the Targeted Youth and Family Engagement Project. I found lockdown very difficult. It made me sad and lonely. I had to isolate because of my health. So wasn't able to go to school when offer, offered it. The, the youth service tried very hard to keep me busy, giving me lots of opportunities. It was so nice to see them so much on the Zoom meeting. During lockdown, Michelle and Nicola would phone to chat to my whole my whole family to see if we were okay. Every day, Michelle would send us joke to make us laugh. They would send activities back to to my home for my uh, for me and my family to complete it to complete. We would do online cooking every week with Michelle, learning about recipes. Brian would bring the in, in, ingredients to our home. Michelle arranged a very big group camping trip, which took place in our living room uh, while on Zoom. This was so much fun. We made a tent and slept in there for the whole night. Every week, Michelle would invite us a Zoom meeting we will we uh, do a physical activity at home, like all hoops, uh, skipping or steps challenge. We took part in a big bird watch where made bird feeders to increase, encourage the birds to our garden. We played bingo on Zoom and I won. My sister learned her numbers. Michelle came to visit and we went for a walk. This made me feel happy. When we were okay to start going out, Michelle and Nicola took us to the allotment but where my family have been growing vegetables such as the carrots. This is my favorite place. I love the 
not month, it makes me so happy when I go there. The youth service have made me my life such better and make me happy. And I want to say thank you for Michelle and I'm really happy to join youth club. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Rami. No so it's a, I'm sure it's a big thumbs up for, for everyone for having the courage to come on screen in front of all these strangers tonight, Rami. So thank you so much for that. I think it's also a big thumbs up for Michelle, your youth worker. Um, she she's here, but she's got a she's got a screen off tonight. Um, just I just will say, Rami was referring there to the joke for the day, which we had in the youth service, um, which we circulated to everybody. I can tell you the jokes were absolutely dreadful. Um, but they serve to raise morale amongst not just our young people, but our staff as well. And we're going to keep those going, I think. Rami, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, no problem. Look forward to meeting you in person again soon. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you. And by all means, turn off your, your screen and your mic now. Um, uh, and we will see you again soon. Thank you very much, Rami. And um, if you want to stay um, for the, you know, the rest of the meeting, you're very, very welcome. Um, I'm just uh, blown away by your response, and I'm so glad that uh, Michelle was able to help you with all sorts of activities during that time. Thank you very much again. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, we, we have one more uh, young person who would like to come on and have a, and have a chat with you as well. Um, uh, we had loads who wanted to come on today, but um, we haven't got time for that, have we? So uh, we, we, we cruelly selected um, uh, two people. And our second, uh, last but not least tonight, is, is Lottie. So Lottie, are you there? If you are, please turn on your screen and your microphone. There she is. Hello, Lottie. How are you doing? <laughs> Hi. I'm good, thanks. Glad the technology is working, Lottie. Yeah, um, the only thing is I have to read this script like off my phone, yeah. so I don't know if my camera will stay on when I'm reading it. I'll try. I'll try my best though. Look, just go for it. You've got a you've got okay. a very friendly room here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak tonight to share my experiences of how the youth service and youth forum worked with me and other forum members since the start of lockdown and what it meant to us. The very first week of lockdown, we moved to virtual youth forum meetings using Zoom. We had a weekly timetable of sessions. Monday, we had youth cabinet. Tuesday, we had a social session where we did fun activities like cooking or craft and had resources delivered by youth workers. It was so nice to have the chance to see our youth workers on the doorstep to chat to us. Once I stood outside with the youth worker, Kayla, um, me and my mum, chatted for an hour and a half in the freezing cold but it was so good to see someone on a wednesday we had a project group where we continued to work on our image on our priority issue which was to raise awareness of the emergency services we have produced a board game as, and we are nearly ready to get this signed off to print and give out as an educational resource this is where lockdown came in handy as we met with youth workers much more and were able to work on this more often on a Thursday, we then had quiz night and competitions where we had prizes to keep everyone busy and involved. We had something to look forward to most days of the week. We had great connections with youth workers since the start of COVID. During lockdown, we started WhatsApp groups for the different youth forum sessions. This meant we had contact with youth workers throughout the day and were kept engaged in group chats and had reminders of meetings on different days. Some young people said they had youth workers contacting them every week to check how they were uh, doing or regular one-to-one -one calls with ones who needed it. It is so important to us to have these sessions even though online. It was a sense of normality. Virtual sessions gave us a routine and we had a forum before COVID, but then we still had it through lockdown. However, we had a lot more fun sessions and less of the formal meetings to keep everyone distracted and to help boost mental well-being. We also had weekly quizzes and competitions from the curriculum project. The youth cabinet also designed competitions and challenges to put out onto the youth service social media to raise awareness of the youth service as a good way to engage. We also had a step challenge which helped us get moving and keep us entertained and fresh air to help our mood. We were given lots of opportunities outside of the youth forum like Rec Rock, 
some people learnt BSL and it felt like a personal touch knowing more about what we liked as we were in contact a lot more. Young people needed the fun and a pick-me-up so these opportunities were good. I feel as though I still have the opportunity to represent young people view young people's views at a local and national level. I met with a deputy minister during lockdown and other foreign reps met with the first minister on a different occasion. We had the opportunity to discuss how COVID had impacted upon our learning experience. These meetings were a good example of a positive outcome of lockdown as we have never been invited to, a meet, to meet with the ministers before. I have also met with the Children's Commissioner for Wales as part of the Community Ambassadors Programme to share our experiences. Locally, we have met a few times with the Leader of the Council and Paul Warren and the Director Ed Edmonds to discuss our issues and concerns regarding online learning. Returning to schools, following the lockdowns and sharing our concerns. These were really beneficial as they were local and we could have feedback on things we could change. I also presented to you all earlier this year to update you on the forum activity and I had a chance to present to the PSB which meant some services worked with us to create the board game. I have also become the MYP for Kapili, attending national meetings virtually so the pandemic didn't stop us getting our voices heard but we only had this from being involved in the youth service. Lessons learned and maybe that we had too many virtual sessions. Some people were feeling a bit burnt out adapting to the change in life, virtual learning and youth sessions. So we have lost a lot of young people, but we're trying to build this back up. A lot of young people struggled online and didn't want the camera on, and it was difficult to make connections until face-to-face -face sessions started back up. There were a lot of technical issues for staff and young people adapting to online sessions. And sometimes youth workers didn't have the right technology to engage with us. But we were glad that when we met with the leader, she said we could continue using Zoom as we were worried at one point we would have to use Teams. We had a gradual return to face-to-face -face sessions, which was good for people's anxiety about meeting up. We started with outdoor sessions in parks across the borough where we would get dropped, we, sorry, where we would get dropped off to play rounders and eat chips. This helped us feel comfortable meeting up again but it was the best feeling ever to start getting picked up on a minibus and go into indoor meetings. The sessions really start on the bus, so getting transport back has really been important to us. But this has all been done in a safe way with masks. We are meeting in Kofili Miners at the moment, but, for, but the forum reps really want to go back into Penalta House for their meetings. We need to feel normality. When we can go back, it will feel like a closure on COVID. Forum is about inclusion and equality, and we hope to return to meetings in the main council building soon to feel our meetings are being taken more seriously. Youth service has always been positive to me. I've never had a negative experience. Some young people say they didn't see anyone outside of their family if it wasn't for virtual meetings. If youth workers were furloughed, it would have been so negative for us. We needed consistency and we had it. It's been an awful challenging time for everyone, but we were so glad to have their support. Well done. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank After you, your job next, Paul. <laughs> well, can I be first to congratulate Lottie on her, her appointment in 10 years' time as First Minister? <laughs> um, uh, so if, if anybody in the room wants the personal phone number of the, um, of the Education Minister, just ask Lottie. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Lottie. That was uh, predictably yeah, very fab. good, Lottie. And Thank you. Up to your usual polished standards. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Lottie. I would like to say I really enjoyed your presentation and uh, being a forum rep. You know, obviously, there's there's been a lot of work um, involved in that, and. Yes, <laughs> I think you may, may be uh, in the Senate before long. <laughs> um, <laughs> Councillor Derek Harvard would like to say something. Hi, Paul. Congratulations on keeping the service going during this very difficult time. Can I ask you about uh, NEETS? Um, how many courses are made available now? Is, is there an expansion? Of, of the number of courses available for uh, young people to join um, and where where, where, and where are they? Where are they being held and who's running them? 
I know that's a big, big, big question. I don't want a long answer. Just a quick answer will do very. Thank you very much. Um, we've had loads of sessions. Normally in Caffili Miners, they've been for a while, um, and we've had different sessions with a lot of different charities, um, like Safe and um, there's like a homeless project we've been doing. So we've had a lot of meetings going on but they normally take place in Caffili Miners. Well, thanks, Lottie. I think Lottie beat me to it then, didn't she? Um, <laughs> she did. So there we are. <laughs> Sorry. If, you need, if you need a proof, but there, there it is. Uh, no, thank you, Derek. Um, actually, I, I, I can, I, it is a bit a long answer to that one. And we do have a special scrutiny plan for next month uh, on that very topic. So I would be giving the game away. But what I would say is, yes, there is an expansion, but also, we are more efficiently trying to gather together the opportunities that currently exist that people don't necessarily know about. So it's a it's a bit of a two sided answer to to that one. Um, uh, and again, I don't want to give too much away from next month, but we we, we do have plans to centralize all such opportunities um, for young people, because the problem we found is that there are whilst opportunities are out there. People don't know where to find them and there is no one central authoritative source of information on vocational development um, and what we call destinations. Yeah. So yes, the uh, opportunities are expanding, for example, apprenticeships and traineeships, um, but they are coming out of the woodwork pretty quickly. And we need to be very organized in terms of how we gather that information together and present it not just to young people, but to schools and to parents and to everyone else in local authorities. Thanks, Paul. I'm happy to wait for the discussion, next discussion we have. But um, I, I was wondering about the the amount of traineeships and apprenticeships. Uh, are they increasing? In in your in your experience, are they exp are they exp are they have they been increasing or diminishing during COVID? They, they are increasing. Um, Welsh government has just awarded um, a couple of significant contracts to um, to third sector agencies to take forward both apprenticeship and traineeship offers. Um, so that is a literal expansion. Um, I, I can't give a, a number or a figure to the numbers available, but I can tell you that apprenticeships and traineeships are the way forward. They are being touted by Welsh Government and others as that. Uh, but of course, they already exist, for example, in our own engagement and progression framework, which is the, um, the partnership that deals with reducing needs figures. Um, we do have a, a lot of opportunities available by work-based learning providers um, and further education institutions. So we, we're, not st we're not starting at ground zero, um, but the opportunities for apprenticeships are increasing. Well, that's encouraging. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carol Andrews, please. Uh, it's, it's not a question, just a, a, a brief comment, really. I just want to say thank you to Paul and, and Lee. We, my daughter and I um, were, in, were invited by the Youth Service in, in Risca to give a, a dementia-friendly session to the young people there as part of the Integrated Wellbeing Network. And, you know, we saw firsthand how brilliant the children re interact on Teams and that, and it was a really good session. So thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you. Um, Councillor Phil Bevan. Yeah, Paul, thanks thanks for that. Thanks for the work you do and uh, congratulations to you and your team because I know they work uh, really hard and they've got those, those kids uh, in their hearts. Um, with regard uh, uh, to apprenticeships, I mean, the worst thing that one of the worst things that Maggie Thatcher did was to get rid of the engineering and training boards, the uh, construction industry training boards, where virtually uh, the, the companies were well, blackmailed really into taking on apprenticeships. And of course, what's happening now in the community is we are suffering from that lack of, of talent out there. But the one thing I was going to ask for with the the unit down in Caffili, how's that going at, uh, at Virginia Park? Is there is there a report on whether that's progressing or not? Uh, yes, um, it is progressing. Um, after a, a long fallow period, um, uh, not helped by, by COVID, of course, yeah. Um, we are about to go to tender, possibly even this Friday, all the, the refurbishment work that needs to take place on the building. Um, and uh, I, 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 you're probably going to ask me next, when will it be finished? I mean, I, it's a very hard question to answer. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, t the tender period must be one month uh, to allow companies to put in a bid. 
therefore the work will not start for at least another month's time. Um, of course, in the winter, then we have possible delays with rain and, and, and bad weather and all the rest of it. Um, and we understand that the building work will take around 13 weeks once it gets underway. So we are looking at a completion, certainly by the summer term next year. Um, and I'm sorry, it's, not, it's that's a little vague, um, but it's very hard to, to give a, a, an accurate date on, on this. The, the building will be very significant for us when it's built. Um, uh, it will be the hub of youth work for the Caffili Basin area, servicing around 5,000 young people. Um, we also have a major partner involved in that, in that we have um, our friends and inclusion services there during school hours doing, doing their thing. So there's a, a nice education double whammy going on there. Um, much of our outreach and detached work uh, and all the other fancy stuff that we do will emanate from the building. And the building will also house uh, many uh, fixed staff as well. So it'll be very exciting when it's online and um, certainly when we have the ground opening, everyone in this room will be invited because it has been a while coming. It's very wise for you to make, uh, not to make promote, uh, promises that are let down by others, especially with developers. I was wondering whether the IRV are involved at all in helping you with anything. They've got money to spend. They could be send, spending something there, perhaps. Well, they, they tell me they're, they're, they're broke, Phil. <laughs> um, but actually, we have a partnership with the IRV. Um, we have a standing partnership with them and Calcilli Mentelli anyway. Um, and we have just secured funding from Welsh Government to take forward a Welsh language youth work strategy here. Um, we are currently auditing and surveying young people across the authority in terms of the quality of the Welsh language services they receive. Uh, and I'm pleased to be able to say we'll be opening up a, de a dedicated Welsh language youth club in Virginia Park uh, when it opens. Oh, I and of course, of course, we're a stone's throw from the Agwindi site. So that's a very, very nice, happy coincidence with that. But, but the intention is to promote bilingualism across the youth service. Thank you very much. That's lovely. Can I ask um, Carol Andrews, um, is that a historic hand? It is. Thank you. Well, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's OK. Um, well, Paul, I really enjoyed the presentation. I have to say um, you, pay, you play a pivotal role in the youth service and it was so heartening to hear that, you know, there were regular phone calls and even they were on the end of a phone, you know, so that these vulnerable children could, you know, access help if they needed it at any time. And and I'm really glad that you focused on the vulnerable and included their families in it. And that was clear from Rami, Rami's presentation that, you know, having a um, a camping in his living room and sleeping overnight. And, it, you know, you could see how much he enjoyed it because he, you know, he lit up when he was saying it. But um, thank you very much for everything that you do in that service it it is a vital service and uh yeah i look forward to seeing some of the recipes that you sent out for the cooking as well we'll send them through and perhaps uh, the joke for the day <laughs> if michelle would pass them on <laughs> by all means thank you very much oh, um, thank you very much paul and very of course the, the presentation you. will be available to, to members afterwards and if anyone wishes to follow up with any additional questions by all means do so thank you thank you thank you very much indeed that's lovely all right okay if we'll move now to um item seven could i ask ross whiting whiting to um introduce the scrutiny report please thank you councillor yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. And I, I don't know how I'm going to follow that presentation by the youth service, Rami and Lottie, but, you know, about everything they've been doing over the pandemic, but I will try. So um, this item seeks the views of the Education Scrutiny Committee on the 21st Century Schools Ban B Phase 2 proposals um, in the committee's role as an official consultee. Um, as members will recall from the previous meeting held on the 21st of September, the three Ban B Phase 2 proposals are the amalgamation of Lankayak Junior School and Lampabon Infant School to create a new primary school, a new replacement Plaza Vellum Primary School, and the establishment of a Centre for Vulnerable Learners, also known as a Pupil Referral Unit, on the former Pontland Fife Comprehensive School site. More detail on each of the proposals is contained in the full consultation documents attached to this report, 
and I believe Andrea West may wish to come in after my introduction to add some further detail um, to these three proposals. The consultations have been undertaken in line with the report considered by this committee at its last meeting and following approval by Cabinet on the 13th of October. The consultation on all three proposals started on the 20th of October and is due to conclude at midnight on the 1st of December this year. So under 3.1, scrutiny members will see the recommendations, which are to note the information contained in the report and the attached consultation packs, provide, v be, provide views in your capacity as consultees as part of the consultation processes being followed for all three proposals, and C, to vote on each proposal separately, which will be noted as part of the minutes of this meeting and included in the relevant re reports for each proposal, which will be presented to Cabinet as part of the decision-making process. And all this for the reasons contained in the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Ross. Um, and is Andrea West available? I am, Chair, yes, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. Um, good evening there. So um, we have um, a, a few questions. Um, we'll, we'll go in order of uh, the scrutiny um, pre-meeting first. Could I have Councillor Brenda Miles, please? Thanks very much, Chair. Yeah, I, I was, I'm totally in support of the merger. It's within my ward um, uh, and I think it's, uh, there are many benefits that will come from merging the two schools and they're all well set out in the report, so that's great. But my one concern remains the size of the site. And I'm sure the last time that we looked at some proposals, um, an artist's impression of the new building that would go up there was that it would be a two-storey building. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that remains a concern for me. Um, I was looking at page 49 of the report where it talks about the importance of outdoor education uh, for the children. And I know that um, certainly in an infant school setting, it's very important for the children to have... Um, the ability to f free flow between the in inside classroom and the outside learning environment. And I and I think a two storey building just doesn't lend itself very well to that sort of um, part of the curriculum. So so really, my question is, is well, I don't know if there is a question there really, but it's more of an observation is that I think, um, you know, there's some talk in the in the report about expanding the site, utilising some um, uh, spare ground. I think that's really important and I hope that does come off. But uh, yeah, generally, the, you know, if you could comment on that concern I've got about the layout of the school and the, and the um, ability to use the outdoor area um, well, please. Yeah, certainly, Chair. Do you, do you want me to respond? Yes, please. In relation to the infant building, that will remain as is. So we're not proposing any sort of structural changes, albeit there may be some internal adaptions, obviously, to ensure that the um, infant building um, meets and marries up with the new building. So we wouldn't want sort of like an old building and a new building. So there'll be some internal um, sort of refurbishment work undertaken. So the access for the children from the infant department will remain as is. The junior department is the way we're proposing to do a two storey extension. And the reason for that is, as we rightly say, outdoor space is very important. So in order to ensure that there's adequate outdoor space to meet the needs of the children and the curriculum, the only way that they can actually, we can actually fit it into that particular site would to do a two-storey um, expansion of the school, but only for the junior element of it. Obviously, there'd be a lift, so it would be DDA compliant. So the children, if they, you know, if they had um, any disabilities, they would be able to access um, the school. Um, and with regards to the um, expansion of the curtilage of the school, you are correct in what you're actually saying. Um, if you remember, there was a former uh, boys club outside the curtilage of the school. That area has been reserved for uh, the expansion and we're proposing to bring that into the actual uh, school boundary. Lovely, thank you. Uh, if I could just make one more comment on that, because um, I, I, I'll still have this bugbear that I wish it was a single story school, because um, the junior school, at a, as it is at the moment, is a split site, you know, the higher level building and then a lower level building. And I know that's not ideal for the 
for the movement of children around the school. So I, think, I know you, but you say it, and I'm glad to know that that area of land has been reserved for the school, but it will remain, a, you know, an issue for me <laughs> that we can't design a school on one level. But thanks yeah. for the answer. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Phil Bevan. Councillor Bevan, you're on mute. I've never done this before, you see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the Placerville Insight um, is uh, it's just a proposal at the moment and no details of, of the building, I expect, or no. where it's going to go. We know where it's going to go. It's going where the existing site is. You've got um, a bit of a slope and then you've got a, a green area down below. So we're down actually proposing we're actually proposing to build a school down below and then mm. demolish the existing school site and obviously in, expand the sort of parking provision, which hopefully will alleviate any sort of um, issues with regards to drop off, etc., that they're currently experiencing from parents. Oh, that'll be good because that's one of the problems. I mean, there's a number of things to be talked about later on when the details come through, I suspect. But at the moment, there are things that we need to say, but perhaps not now, perhaps when the details of the site comes up. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Martin, uh, Martin, Mr. Martin Weston. Uh, yeah. Um, just on the impact on other schools of Placervelin School, um, in the uh, second paragraph, it mentions uh, the impact on, uh, sorry, in the first paragraph, it mentions the impact by percentage on other schools and mentions 39.45% attending faith and Welsh medium provision. And yet in, in tables uh, 4A and 4B, it, it doesn't mention any impact at all on the, the face school, uh, in this case being St Helens in Caerphilly. I just wondered, is that an omission? Um, no, in, in as much as we were looking at the um, immediate primary um, facilities from um, an English medium perspective, as opposed to the Welsh medium and faith, um, I think, um, as we've demonstrated previously, um, Mr. Weston, in relation to um, the faith element within Caerphilly and the Welsh media, there is adequate demand. So it isn't envisaged that that would further impact on those particular schools because obviously they are specialised in their area of delivery. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Could I go back to um, Llankayach and Llanfaben, um, Andrea? Um, is there anything, um, you know, proposed for the decommissioning of Clan Kayach. Um, and really, there's another question there. Do you think um, there will be an impact on the Welsh medium schools? And do you think it's, en you know, of any concern to Broata or Penartai? I wouldn't have thought so because we're not expanding it greatly. If you actually look, there are actually um, a large percentage of out-of-catchment children actually attending the school. So yeah. the reason being that we're managing the number appropriately is to cater for the encatchment demand and the numbers coming through from our projections are looking purely at English medium provision. Um, I think both Pranalta and Broalta um, have adequate numbers coming through from a Welsh medium perspective. Lovely. Thank, thank you. OK. Um... Can, can I give you a question regarding the referral unit now? <laughs> Sorry, mm -hmm. Andrea, you, we, we're um, flipping from one site to another, but I think it's important. Um, I noted that um, the referral unit, um, the, there hasn't been a, a condition survey done for many years. Um, uh, can I ask why why this hasn't been done really um, before this proposal? And do you think it's going to, you know, has the finance of, uh, you know, of any works needing doing is being factored in? Yeah, there wasn't a condition survey undertaken on um, this site previously because obviously it was a school that was declared surplus to education at the time. Obviously, we've revisited and we're obviously revitalising the, the site for educational provision. 
Um, so there will be a condition survey undertaken at, at when it's up and running. But our property services team have worked quite thoroughly um, identifying where they would need to be refurbishment. And I think we're satisfied that the budget that we've asked Welsh Government for, albeit obviously in the current climate we're in, could change. But the, the, the current sort of budget we're asking for should be adequate to meet the provision we're proposing going forward. Oh, lovely, thank you. There was something else as well. Um, I noted from, from the table that um, there are um, 80 pupils having home tuition at the moment. Um, that's quite high on, on that scale. Can, can, you, can you tell me, do you, do you know, is it by choice, the, the, um, the family's choice that it's at home tuition or is it something else? Are we talking about community home tuition or electively home educated children? Well, this is what I'm asking, really, because on on I, I haven't written down the page now. Sorry. Um, on the table there, it said 80 and it said current. So I'm not sure whether it's elected or. OK, OK, um... I, sorry. Is Kerry or Sarah Ellis, is, can Kerry answer that one? Sorry, Kerry. Ken, Kerry's yeah, on the list. It's okay, Thank yeah. You. It relates to um, community tuition. Electively, home, edu home educated children are educated at home, um, with sometimes with support from the LA. But this number is in regard to the number of pupils having community tuition. Children will access that service when they, for a number of reasons, they can be um, temporarily ill, they can be um, waiting for placement into another um, facility, they can be um, unable to attend a school site because uh, for medical reasons, um, anxiety, a whole host of reasons why they would need that personal tuition service. What we're trying to do by bringing it together here is to reintegrate pupils into small groups at first and then build up to larger groups with a view to some of those pupils being able to return to school. Um, so it just gives a facility for that, which we're very grateful for because that will um, be a halfway house really to return into school for many pupils, which is what we're after. OK, thank you very much. My my other question, I'm sorry, is um, regarding Glan and Ant as well. I know it's been earmarked for Key Stage 2 children and Ponter and Fright for Key Stage 3 and 4. Do you think that at a future date that um, the Glan and Ant would go to Ponter and Fright? No, we, we don't anticipate that. We believe we need both sites. This this PIU is going to be a portfolio PIU, which will have several, think of a hub and spoke model that we've got with Trinity Fields. There'll be several different sites in usage uh, across the borough. Um, that's helpful geographically, but it also helps to keep um, children in separated according to age or need or whatever. So um, we need all the space we can get to make sure that they have the best of the facility as well. Oh, that's because lovely. even though even though we're talking about some relatively small numbers, you need more space and you need more facility. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you, so thank you very much. As well. We're also in, um, expanding um, Glan and Ant pupil referral unit currently to cater for the needs of the key stage two children going forward. Yes, I, d I did notice. Thank you, because there's two additional classrooms to go there. That's that's great. Thank thank you, Andrea. Um, Councillor Phil Bevan. Yeah, two 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 uh, questions. Well, a question and statement. Will this this new uh, referral unit will it cover all those ones that we had to send out of catchment for their need? Um, will it be all contained within Cafili, or is that going to still be a problem? And the other is uh, a question with regard to. Remember when the Oakdale School um, was being suggested to be built by others, while well, our design and uh, development team, Julian Harding and co, were told they were not um, capable of doing it, even though they just built the comprehensive down in Caffili. Uh, eventually, they did take it on. And I was just wondering who's going to be doing all the contract work here uh, for these developments, or has that not been decided yet? The actual proposal will actually go out to tender for construction, but it would be managed by Julian's team. OK. Right. 
And yes. will it uh, will this new referral unit cater for all the problems that we have with education? It will cater for the majority. Kerry, if you want to expand. Yeah, we, we you know, it's always difficult to predict, isn't it, when Absolutely. children have additional learning needs or they need different facilities and, and we can't legislate for, you know, people moving into the area or whatever. But given the information we have and given the approach that we take in, um, which is to, you know, have earlier intervention. So we, we get to children and young people at an earlier stage. They're able to reintegrate into school um, more easily. So given given our kind of approach to this, Councillor Bevan, we're hopeful that it will be sufficient. Yes, but time will tell. I wouldn't want to be, um, you know, making those sorts of predictions. OK, Thanks. thank you. Oh, lovely, thanks. Um, can I ask you any other questions on item seven? OK, so we will go uh, to the recommendations on page 20 in your packs. Could I have somebody to move the recommendation, please? Yeah, I move them, quite happy. Thank you, Councillor Phil Bevan. And a seconder? I second. Thank you, thank you Councillor Harvard. OK, we are going to be voting um, individually on these. So it will be for Llancaia Junior School and Llanfaban Infant School initially. That's on member screens now, Chair. Thank you very much. And if you can submit your votes, please. Oh, I did. Did I go too soon or what? <laughs> Can I ask, has that been carried, Mark? Yes, that's been carried unanimously, Chair. 13 votes for, no against and no abstentions. Wonderful. And could we have the next voting, uh, please? Is that Plaza Vellin Primary School? That's right, Chair. That's on screens now. Plaza Vellin Primary School. It's exciting, this, isn't it? Waiting for the result. And uh, you're <laughs> really worried, Carl. <laughs> yeah, Back to been, the drawing board, perhaps. That's been carried unanimously as well, Chair. 12 <laughs> votes for, zero votes against, and uh, no abstentions. Lovely. Thank you very much. And the Centre for. Uh, you Andrea worried, Phil. That'll be the day. Sorry? You said Andrea looks worried. That'll be the day. She's we'll taking have the a next difficult job. Now. She's doing an excellent job. You ought to be paid she's, more, she's, I think. She's the okay. coolest person in the room. Yeah. If I could interrupt you, please, gentlemen. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Jim. The recommendation <laughs> is um, there for voting on now for the vulnerable learners, the pupil referral unit, please. That's also been carried unanimously, Chair. We've got 14 votes for and zero votes against and no abstentions for that proposal. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. We'll move on now to item you, nine. Andrea. Great job. Um, Welsh in Education Strategic Plan 2022 to 2032. The 10-year plan. If I could ask Councillor Whiting to... Um, introduce yeah thank you chair um i'll try to keep my introduction short as i know sarah much may want to go into the details but uh, as members will see from the report this item contains the proposed welsh in education strategic plan also known as the wesp for the period 2022 to 2032 mm -hmm. the wesp is a statutory requirement and is aimed at contributing towards the welsh government's minimum targets of 26 percent of all year one cohort in welsh medium by 2032 and of 1 million Welsh speakers by 2050. 
As members will see from the plan, to meet this target, we will need to build a new primary school and expand others to create the necessary places. We will also need a communications plan to increase the take up of places, starting with additional opportunities for access Welsh medium early years provision. We will also include expanding our Welsh speaking workforce. These much needed developments will be supported by Welsh Government capital funding alongside the 21st Century Schools Ban B programme, which will be carefully planned to ensure any impact on English medium schools is minimised. Members will see more detail on the content of the WESP through the report and in the draft strategy, which is an appendix to this report. It would be remiss of me at this point not to express my thanks to Sarah Much and her team for the fantastic work, they, work they've done on this to date and in such a short time. I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the members of the Welsh Education Forum for their extremely valuable input in the workshops and consultations that have helped to shape the plan in its current form. Together, this represents a true team effort between a range of partners, each of whom are very passionate about increasing the number of Welsh speakers and doing everything we can towards the 1 million speakers by 2050 target. The WESP is currently out for consultation until the 5th of December 2021, and comments will then be considered for the final version of the plan to be taken to Cabinet on the 8th of December, ready for submission to Welsh Government by January 2022. The intention will then be uh, for the publication of the plan in summer 2022, following Welsh Government ministerial approval and implementation from September 2022. Therefore, the recommendations in the report under 3.1 are that members are asked to receive the Welsh in Education strategic, strategic Plan as part of the consultation program, pro process and comment regarding sufficiency of information and targets to achieve the outcome areas and meet our minimum 26% target in year one cohort by 2032, all for the reasons contained in 4.1 and throughout the report. I believe Sarah much uh, may wish to come in at this point and give her introduction to the report. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Whiting. Um, yeah, I, we've tried to um, capture everybody's views in this report. I think the targets throughout the outcome areas are quite stretching. Um, and as Councillor Bevan mentioned at the beginning, we have got a task around ensuring we have sufficient Welsh medium workforce in order to um, deliver our um, 10 year plan. It is a 10 year programme, so we've got a lot of work to do and we will have task groups that are, are set up underneath our Welsh Education Forum to drive this work forward um, in, a, in all of the outcome areas in reality. Um, but fundamentally, our communication plan will be part of a regional group, which is around promotion of Welsh language provision and that continuity of Welsh language um, throughout uh, not just Welsh medium schools, but also English medium schools. Um, I've, I think uh, Councillor Wynton summarised the report very well. Um, so if there's any questions now, uh, this would be great as part of the consultation process. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Councillor Phil Bevan. <clears throat> I don't know how many other people are going to ask questions. I've got a question on page 139 and another one on 152. So anybody questions before that or in between, now is the opportunity. Or should I just continue? Please continue. Phil. Please continue. Keep jobs in. Uh, it's, it's just a question on uh, outcome two. And I did mention it before to you on page uh, 139. The fact that you're mentioning category one and category two English and Welsh medium language schools, I would like to see that removed because the one thing we don't want to, to build in the southeast Wales or, or central Wales is uh, bilingual schools because it's Welsh medium education is the only way down here. If you're talking about Gwynedd, yes, put it in because the kids there from Eng from Welsh speaking backgrounds need to go to school to learn how to speak English, which is a, <laughs> a bit of a turnaround. But down here, and certainly maybe down as far as Neath and Clenetley, all those areas there, bilingual education is not a way forward. When Jane Davidson was uh, in the early days before a lot of you were born, well, I wouldn't say all of you were born, but uh, uh, she said that um, eventually after an argument with me, I said the only way forward for Wales, if you want a bilingual Wales, is through Welsh medium education. And I got a letter which she signed. So if anybody wants to see it, I can show you. And she said the only way forward is through Welsh medium education. It worked in uh, Canada, in you know, Quebec. It worked in Israel and it's working in Wales. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think we ought to take that out 
It, it is suggest. actually a, a mistake, uh, Councillor Bevan, you recognised it. It's um, We've got two main categories, either Category 1 or it should be or Category 3 Welsh Language School. Question. We do not have any Category 2 English Welsh Language Schools delivering. Yeah. Well, I'm glad about so that. I, I, thought you, that. I thought you were sneaking mistake. one in somewhere. No, no, I've changed that one. That is a mistake. <laughs> Can I, I do the other one now? Yes, yes. please. Um, it, it's, it's something you mentioned about the lack of Welsh medium teachers, but on page uh, 26 on my old report, what is it? Uh, 152, option 7. You refer to the work we need to do with EAS, the National Academy for Education Leadership. And I'm just wondering what work is happening with that, if any, none I suspect. And why haven't we contacted the Welsh Joint Education Committee? Ian Morgan down there is very interested in my suggestion for a um, Welsh medium teacher's course to run in parallel with whatever main courses a pupil is taking. I know uh, Delith Jewell is in touch with uh, um, one of your, what was, her, what was her name, Anwin? I know, Awin Perry? No, 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 what was her name? Awin. Anwin Penny, down in the Welsh language section. She seemed to show an interest in it, and I think they're exploring the fact that there <coughs> could possibly be a course at uh, GNVQ or, or GCSE level to catch them early. Media yeah, Descali and Maithrin, now as you mentioned in your report, uh, come, came forward with two sp specific courses for carers and for, for leaders. They've done it, so why can't they do it for Welsh medium education? And of course that's called going come Rumley, as you said again in your report, when I asked the head about it, gave him the, the, the um, courses, he's introducing them in September next year to catch young people early. And it's not just for education, it could be for care units. So it's, it, it'll be a good move. And I think uh, there's a lot of work to do on that. And I, I you, you appreciate that we're short of Welsh medium teachers. I know uh, uh, Ross has said that we need to expand the process, but you can't expand if you don't have the materials to expand into. And if you haven't got the teachers, how are you going to do it? I know you're aware of it, but I just thought yeah. I'd have another rant. <laughs> this is an area that Welsh Government is looking at in quite some detail and there's a lot of work going on with um, teaching institutions but also with the different uh, qualifications to plan a pathway going through. Um, you're right, Midid Maithrin have worked with the um, CASH qualifications, so the uh, Social Care Wales have got their childcare qualifications that have just been revised and Midid Maithrin have worked with the Earth to do the, the apprenticeship scheme. So there's lots of connections I think that are happening around childcare they're now looking at how they do that within the teaching workforce as well. I wouldn't say we can do it as Caffili, but I think on a national level, we will feed into that to try and help um, because we all need them. You're right. Um, but that is why it's in the 10 year plan as an area of concern that we all need to focus on. And that's what Welsh Government are looking at is they are looking at all of the plans and then next year we'll have thematic groups that will look at what they need to do on a national level. As well okay, as any, well. any information I get from the Senate, I'll pass it on to you. Fab, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And Kerry Cole would like to come in. <clears throat> Sorry, my hand's not up. <laughs> oh, it was showing up. Sorry. <laughs> okay. But she yeah. hasn't used this system very often, do you see? Uh, can Can I ask? Are there any other questions for Sarah this evening? No, well, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so we'll go to the recommendations are on page 120, but we were only asked to receive um, these as part of the um, Welsh in Education Plan. So there'll be no vote this evening, OK? Um, that will not bring us to the end of the meeting. We have an, any, any other business that I've allowed. And if I could have Councillor John Roberts, please. Hello, Dioch Adairydd. Before I carry on, do you know, I've still got a line that's buzzing around in my head after what Lottie said. Paul O'Neill and Rami and Lottie, thank you for everything you've said. Um, Lottie's line, I don't know if you remember, she said, if youth workers were furloughed. And having listened to what Paul told us, and having listened to what Rami and Lottie told us, didn't they do well? Oh, yes. 
you know, absolutely. Gotta take. But that line from Lottie, if she's still here, don't know if she is. Thank you, Lottie. Thank you, Rami. And thank you, Paul O'Neill, as ever. Um, thank you, Chair, for allowing me any other business. Not so long ago, we all celebrated and enjoyed the celebrations of the Olympians, gold medal winners. Didn't they do well again? And to me, there's another Astromanach lady that struck gold as well. We've got a local lady living in Astromanach, Dr Ellen Jones. Dr Ellen Jones is a historian. Before that, she worked at the National Museum of Wales in the Learning and Education Department. And before that, I believe she was head of history in Ascot Company. She was. Well, Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones has produced a new book, Welsh medium and English medium, um, and it's a visual journey through five thousand years of Welsh history. It covers everything, and even on the front, on the hard cover, on the front, on the front of the book. There's a flag with the word St. Henneth on it. Boy, am I pleased. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's bang on time because whether it be compulsory or not for Curriculum Wales, it's a really good source book, especially from the ages 8 to 12, others after as well. I always remember a few years ago, my eldest grandson, and he went to us called Cum Rumney. Now, I remember picking him up early one afternoon after he sat a history GCSE exam. And our camera was in the car, and I'm driving down. All right, you okay? And then you ask the question, what was your Welsh history question for your paper? And he turned to me and he looked at me and he said, didn't have one, didn't need one, it was optional. Well, okay, you might still be optional, but with books like this, for our teachers and for the pupils, yes. I think there's more chance that more of our children will enjoy where they live and what happened here from 5,000 years ago to now. So please do remember this book. We celebrate the Olympians, and rightly so, but this is a gold medal book as well. Yes. And it's bang on tune. It's bang on song, and we're education scrutiny. And if we can't sing the praises of this, something seriously wrong with us. Dear you're, you're absolutely spot on, John. Um, Dr. Ellen Jones is uh, like an eminent um, historian, but she has uh, created something that is so important for our, our youngsters today. Um, Councillor Phil Bevan. Yeah, it's a little bit cheeky of me, really. But uh, now that uh, Kerry Cole is uh, is here, I think she's, she hasn't gone home yet, has she? I'd like to thank her on behalf of Vesco Gavin Cumbrumley for the support that she's given us over a very difficult period. It was appreciated. And we'd like to thank her and her team and thank her for the nice words in the email uh, to the head and myself with regard to a very traumatic period that we went through. Very, very concerning which totally un unnecessary uh, attack on the school, I felt. But it wasn't an attack, it was a... They had some, they had some uh, points to make and they were correct, I suppose. But I'm, uh, over, I'm too biased, I think. But thank you, Kerry, for, for all you did. Appreciate it. Lovely. Um, I'm, I, I believe Kerry has left, but I think um, Ed Edmonds is still I, I here. I haven't left. Oh, you haven't! Oh, good. Oh, good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you heard it firsthand, Kerry. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And and it was a pleasure to be at the feedback um, a couple of weeks ago and to see, um, you know, the the relief and the the joy on on staff's faces. Um, it was a, a real privilege to be there. And and furthermore, just really excited about the future of the school. Um, you know, to have such a, a you know a remarkable group of staff there who can sh who can support and share with other schools in the area as well so really exciting times thank you yes thank you Kay. well that draws our our meeting to an end thank you very much everyone for attending uh so and uh